Uh, yeah. So first of all, a lean mass hyperspawner, uh, I defined in 2017 with the cut points of high LDL, high HDL, low triglycerides. Uh, I won't go into those cut points. Rather, I'd like to focus real quick on the cut points for our study, which is a slightly more relaxed version of that for the keto CTA study. So the eligibility was an LDL cholesterol of 190 milligrams per deciliter or higher, HDL of 60 or higher, and triglycerides of 80 or lower. So that triad is something we tend to find in people who observationally are more likely to be lean and also typically tend to be a bit more fit. And what we've been wanting to do since, I mean, literally since I wrote that article in 2017, is to specifically get them into a study like Keto CTA, where what we're doing is we're uh, recruiting a number of people, which this has now already transpired. A uh, hundred have been recruited. They were flown to the Lundquist Institute, which is out of UCLA, to get uh, blood work and also what's known as a CT angiogram. It's a high resolution heart scan that looks at both soft and calcified plaque. And they would get one scan at baseline and then another one year later for each of the participants. And so with 100 scans for a set of both, we we're able to not only look individually and look at how the data fits there, but also to compare the sets to each other to see at a population level what they look like and what the different subsets of the population look like as far as that those cut points and especially how it associates with plaque development. And so in order to better serve the general public who can use this metabolic tool, we need to understand what's going on and what's the risk. And what Dave stumbled upon through his own journey and then I stumbled upon and we kind of had this convergence is this bizarre pattern where it's the lean insulin sensitive people who have their LDL go through the roof. And Dave, I'm, I'm telling his story for him now, but I do know it pretty well um, as I've gotten to know him. Like he got intensely curious. And because this question wasn't being answered, he went about crowdsourcing, which isn't done, a clinical trial. It isn't done in general. It's definitely not done by an outsider. So the doctor dropped at his feet. He picked it up, crowdsourced a, a study where he then took this population of people and organized to have them flown out to a lipid center to have scans done on their hearts, state-of-the-art coronary CT and geography scans, prospectively a year apart to see how much plaque progresses. We should emphasize this is with the cohort. We had 100 people, as I just mentioned, 80 of those that were comparable to the age range of this other study outside of our study called Miami Heart uh, with principal investigator Karam Nasir. And that we were able from a population they had of 2,400, there was able to be extracted a matched control. So R80 versus another 80 in Miami Heart, they were matched for uh, ethnicity, age, sex, it, and uh, risk factors very closely. And so the neat thing was, is basically we got all of these matches on both sides, except that our average for those 80 for their LDL cholesterol was 272 milligrams per deciliter. For the Miami Heart Group, it was 123, so less than half the LDL. But for our baseline scans, this is the one from last year, we only just had the baseline completed by that point. Uh, the baseline scans, the plaque levels, in spite of there being a, an average of 4.7 years on the diet for those 80, their plaque levels were, were very comparable. Were that there was no statistically significant difference to that of the Miami Heart Group. In fact, it trended to slightly better than the Miami Heart Group. But bottom line is, there was no statistically significant difference between both groups in spite of the Miami Heart Group for almost half a decade having uh, less than half of the LDL. So that was very exciting for us, and we were very interested to see, you know, where the research would come next once we had the longitudinal data. That kind of set the stage and expectation. Um, but then the prospective portion of the study dropped. So again, these participants were going to be followed individually, comparing the person to their own baseline, their baseline being 4.7 years or 4.6 years after they started keto. And then that paper, which has been the center of controversy since April 7th, 2025, when it was published in Jack Advances, um, had some interesting findings. But basically, the, the two major findings are plaque begets plaque, which has been retitled to plaque predicts plaque. It's a little bit more accurate to put it that way. 
the uh, and ApoB does not. So bottom line was if our participants had plaque at baseline, it was more likely that they would have future plaque regression and is more likely that it would be a higher amount of future plaque regression. And this is all kinds of plaque, whether non-calcified plaque, whether calcified and so forth. And the second major uh, finding of interest was that there was no association between this plaque progression and LDL cholesterol or ApoB, that the lipid levels didn't seem to have that association you might expect would be a driver of plaque progression. 